So good afternoon again and welcome to the Library's Conversations on Social Issues series. This week we have the pleasure of having Anne Rutso here and she's going to be talking about the modern, modern eugenics movement, medical ethics, disability justice, and intersectionality. And it's something that I'm looking forward to learning more about. So I'd like to welcome Anne. And just a little bit before saying hello, I forgot this part, is the library does the, this series as a, it grew out of the Occupy Seattle movement and we wanted to have a forum for people to exchange ideas. And just as we buy books out there and materials that cover all different perspectives, and sometimes you're not going to agree with them, but we have them anyway, we wanted to have this space where people can come in and share their perspectives. And you may not agree, but be respectful and learn and share your ideas as well. So, and um, welcome. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Stage. Hello. Thank you for coming, everyone. I'm very excited to be here. And um, yeah, I got an email last quarter asking if I had any social issues that I wanted to talk about. And I was like, yeah, I do. Um, and I think it's really awesome that the library here is trying to promote the dissemination of knowledge and not making books or libraries and pillar of knowledge that isn't accessible to people, but rather giving people the opportunity to talk about things that matter to them and hopefully have productive conversations. Um, with that said, I have no plan for talking about the modern eugenics movement, but I will lay a foundation and perhaps we can talk about that together. Um, so, yes, eugenics, genetics, disability justice, and intersectionality. Uh, so, as I said, um, first I'll be laying the groundwork, the foundation um, in disability studies so that we're all more or less on the same page. And then I will do a small overview of eugenics, the eugenics movement. Um, and then we will think about what modern practices um, or ideologies or laws or etc. Um, that are happening today remind us of this history. Um, so as I'm going through the history, just to get your brain wheels turning about what's going on today that sounds like this. Um, and then we'll have an opportunity to share our thoughts and opinions. Um, so for some of us, this will be an old hat, but um, yes, I'll just start by doing a brief overview of disability studies, which is a framework that I'll be mostly thinking in. Um, so disability studies is an identity studies like gender, women, sexuality studies, or African American studies, but um, around the identity of disability, which to some is a radical concept in and of itself, and some people don't understand and assume that disability studies is some sort of medical analysis of disability as opposed to a cultural um, perspective. So. Um, a large tenet of disability studies is the medical versus social model, which is true of other identity studies too. Um, but the medical mod model locates the problem in the individual. So um, yes, the individual's impairment is their barrier to participation as opposed to other factors in the environment. Um, and this model, of course, focuses on curing the individual to solve this problem as opposed to thinking about more innovative solutions. Uh, and the social model locates the problem not in the individual, but in society. So viewing the barriers as attitudinal or environmental or structural. Um, so for example, um, yes, as opposed to finding an issue with someone not being able to walk upstairs creating a ramp. Um, but that is just the beginning of other examples of, um, yes, the social model. So, um, yes, this is just the difference between viewing disability as a problem with the individual that could or should be fixed, or disability as the result of these attitudinal, attitudinal environmental, and structural barriers in the environment. Um, and when we begin to view disability 
that way, there's more space to understand disability as an expression of diversity um, and a source of cultural identity and pride. So, yes, what happens when we destabilize this view of the norm? Um, and that is kind of what disability studies is exploring. Uh, yes, when I ask the question, what if we as a society were to let go of these expectations of how people should communicate, think, emote, express themselves, look, look, emote, etc. Um, but then also within disability studies, what happens when we destabilize this dichotomy of the medical and social model, which um, is another large question because it's not necessarily just the individual or just society. Um, so, as with all things, it is complicated. Um, also, at any time, if you have anything to interject, please do. Um, you don't even have to raise your hand. I don't care. Um, or, yes, if you have a question, please feel free to ask it. Um, so, this term ableism, like racism or sexism, is the discrimination or prejudice against individuals with disabilities, um, and can include assumptions, practices, attitudes, and beliefs um, that fuel the unequal treatment of people with disabilities on an individual and societal level. It can also include lowered expectations for people with disabilities, um, the denied right to self-expression or determination, um, and also stereotyping, so just lumping people in categories. Um, and a brief note on language and terminology. Um, usually I use person first language in general, which just puts the person before the term disability or the name of the disability. So saying person with a disability instead of disabled person. Um, but some people prefer to put disability or their disability before person um, as a recognition of identity, um, and it depends on the person. Um, some terms for people without disabilities are non-disabled or able-bodied or temporarily bodied. Um, and yes, yeah, the difference between non-disabled or able-bodied is which identity are you centering, either the disability identity or the able-bodied identity. Um, so, does anyone have any questions about disability studies? Which to point about the last point you made about um, uh, uh, how to use the, the name you know, person to person. Uh, I noticed that that um, there's a movement now with, with individuals to take a look at uh, to be prideful of disability. Mm -hmm. And so wanting to use that. People who write about disability, like myself, I write once in a while. I'm not sure how I want to word it. I wonder how you how do you do it to in your writings refer to this as a person to person. I mean, if you're just writing generally, I would probably just make the statement about what you're choosing and why. So you make a statement about it. Okay. Why are you choosing? Okay. I don't know. Does anyone else have thoughts on that? I feel like it's different if you're writing within the disability community, but I don't feel like Generally, in society, there's enough knowledge that that we we can skip that person first language step. I think we're still not there yet. Yeah, definitely. Which is what I was saying, and why I would choose to say person with a disability. Um, but yeah. that's um, yes. Well, in the deaf community, we call ourselves deaf first with a capital D. And that's really to emphasize that we have a strong cultural component to our deafness. And that's really incorporated in our lives. And we don't actually view ourselves as people with disabilities. But it's more of a cultural and a language access issue more than a disability. So we use D, a cap, deaf with a capital D for that. Yes. Oh, no. Uh, the state community, too, is part, something I'm part of, and we tend to use autistic often with capital A. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, this is a question of, like, if you're 
writing with that identity in the community or if you're an outsider writing about um, these communities and yes, how your language would be perceived by the public. Which, yes, is why, yeah, first and first language in general, good way to go. And then, you know, there are exceptions. Um, any other comments at this time? Yes. Well, maybe just um, <laughs> would you? Is it acceptable then to just say which? You know, how do you prefer to be? How do you identify yourself? Like. Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. I, and I ask that up front. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I feel like with most things, it's it's always appropriate to ask people's preferences. Um, yes. And then I forgot to add one thing. Uh, in the deaf community, people prefer either to call themselves deaf with a capital D or hard of hearing, but not hearing impaired, because hearing impaired refers to something that's broken and it's very, very focused on hearing and on the ear instead of on the person as a whole person. So we really tried to change that concept of hearing impairment um, and to really change people's use of language to deaf with a capital D or to hard of hearing. All right, um, moving on. All right, so, eugenics. So, um, the term eugenics, the eugenics movement was coined by Francis Galton, who was Darwin's cousin. Um, Can you speak up? Just keep your... Yes, Thanks. yes, thank you. Um, so the term was coined by Francis Galton, who is Darwin's cousin, was, was, or still is, um, ongoing event um, in 1883, and the word uh, comes from Greek with the U meaning good and genics meaning in birth. So um, it was the science of better breeding um, to improve the quality of the human race in this context um, as these ideas were taken from work with plants and animals and um, applied to people. Um, so yes, it is a science of improvement through better breeding. Um, here, referring to people. Uh, so uh, this was a scientist scientific um, thing that um, used pedigree charts and things like this to track inheritable human characteristics. Um, and for them, it was that simple. Someone had a characteristic, it gets passed down. Um, and that was the science at the time, and that was discrete from the environment or other factors. Um, so. And can yeah. you speak to what the letters are? Oh, right. <laughs> she says it's going very well what the letters are, but the F predominance of Fs, of course. Yes, the F stands for feeble-minded. Which is um charming. <laughs> charming. <laughs> Very charming. And what does it mean? We don't know. Um means anyone who's not a white supremacist, I suppose. Um, so the American eugenics movement um was kind of started by this guy named Charles Davenport um in the late eighteen hundreds. Um he read a lot of Galton at Harvard, um, and yes, started to create the movement here. Um, he was also a scientist, I suppose, and this is a fun one. He hypothesized that Bellosophilia, so you know how to pronounce that, I don't know, or love of the sea, it was a sex linked recessive trait because he only encountered it in males. Um, in the, yeah, the Navy, so he thought that it must only have hurt men, you know. Um, well, yes, like women were not allowed to be naval officers, so how could we say such a thing? Um, but it was true, it was real, it was science. Um, and yes, he also, with other people, established the Eugenic Records Office in Cold Spring Harbor in New York in around 1910. Um, which was a huge hub of the eugenics movement in the U.S. Um, 
two broad categories of eugenics are positive and negative eugenics, with positive um, encouraging reproduction and negative being, yes, trying to prevent people from reproducing. Um, so within positive eugenics was eugenic education, um, which taught people about who they should be breeding with to improve the race, and also um, gave tax preferences and financial support to those people or large eugenic families um, got benefits. And negative eugenics included forced sterilization, um, also restrictive marriage laws, including anti-insignation statutes and restrictive immigration laws. So um, we have a lot going on here. Um, I'm yeah. Uh, positive and negative are not value statements, but what would you say they are? Um, I would say positive is like encouragement with negative being, trying to prevent things from happening, or trying to make things happen and trying to not make things happen. Not value but maybe they are also value statements because the positive eugenics includes um, trying to reward people that are worthy and the negative eugenics targets people that are devalued in society. So, good point, Carrie. Thanks. Um, any other questions in this moment? Okay. Um, so, yes, part of negative eugenics was compulsory sterilization. Um, so the US was an early leader in the sterilization movement uh, and states passed their own laws um, mandating sterilization largely in, were only in institutions? I'm not exactly sure. Yeah, yeah, under the laws it's almost always in institutions, but who really knows what was happening and what continues to happen outside of the institutions. Yeah. We do not know. Um, yeah, so in state institutions and by the year 1920, um, 20 states had forced sterilization laws, and here's a chart of states with sterilization laws in 1935, there are about 30. Um, between 1931 and 1939, over 20,000 institutionalized patients were sterilized. Um, but yes, the eugenicists had the hope of sterilizing millions of people, so they really weren't doing so well for themselves, but that's still a lot of people who were sterilized. Um, so, um, also, yes, who was a eugenicist? Many people were eugenicists, but yes, all people in positions of privilege. Um, but yes, it was not monolithic. There were biologists and psychologists and writers and sex rat holes and people who were supposedly progressive. Um, so the Birth Control League, which was later called Planned Parenthood, um, advocated for more children from for the fit, less from the unfit. This is the chief issue of birth control. Um, and so, yes, Planned Parenthood, which we now think perhaps a radical organization, has its roots, roots in the eugenics movement, and um, birth control was used to prevent the um, appropriation of the unfit. Um, and Margaret Sanger, who is a feminist and a large leader of this movement, um, yeah, would talk about the menace of the people minded and how that was a threat to society. Um, and also about how people's personal choices needed to benefit society at large, so it wasn't really about people's freedom um, or their own choices. Um, so, yes, this is a, this image is at a state fair, and they were having a eugenic and health exhibit, so people could learn about um, eugenics and who they should be breeding with. Um, also at state fairs were better babies contests, and they would, um, yeah, have their criteria for judging babies, and yes, choose the most eugenic ones. 
Um, so yes, a lot of this was really based on the visual. You know, you look at the baby, you know how healthy it is. You look at a person, you know if they're feeble-minded. Um, so yeah, you see a lot of stereotyping and making huge assumptions based on what can be seen. Uh, just a theme. Yes. So, uh, what was the uh, Planned Parenthood or uh, Birth Control League's definition of fit and unfit? Did they specify anything? I mean, it seems to me like Margaret Sanger is a pretty progressive person. She may have had her faults, yes. Mm -hmm. But uh, did they define fit and, and unfit in, uh, you know, like, uh, yeah. a less unjust way than, say, a right mirror? Yes, I would assume. I'm not sure, so I don't know, but I would assume not because these were understood categories. You know, people knew who was fit and who was unfit. Um, so that is definitely something we could look into. But yeah. I might suggest one thing. If we look at the context of the time period, 1900s, early 1900s, what happened? Industrial Revolution happened. And people were employed in these factories and speed and body agility is really important. And so those people who didn't fit into that sort of category of the industrial revolution and where it was going, I think, yeah. us, I think we're considered unfit. That might be one definition that maybe people were looking at to, to judge people if they were fit or not. There was a time in this country of production and productivity and, and the global empire was moving along. Mm -hmm. This is a thought. Definitely. Yes. I'm sorry I'm late, but if you've addressed this, but what did they do with people who were unfit? What did they do to them? Yeah, once they made that distinction, what then? Well, it would depend. Um, people get admitted to institutions where they would then be forcibly sterilized. Um, yes, they... Just sterilization? No. In the U.S. In the U.S. Right. Yeah, it also depends on the country. Um, I don't know. Well, yeah, if they wouldn't be admitted to an institution, I suppose that they would just be encouraged not to have children. Um, so it's more, yeah, and just like that stigma of being unfit. Um, but also, I don't, I'm not very familiar with the process for each individual being labeled as unfit. Or maybe through these sorts of things, you just know that you are not welcome in this sort of space, which... Did it go into an official document? Um, if you would be admitted to an institution. I don't yeah. know if they would track. That's what I'm thinking too, homes. that it's mostly if you found yourself institutionalized and and if you're kinda of thinking what did what did they the people in power do? A lot of folks were forcibly institutionalized for large chunks of their lives, mm -hmm. of course, right? And even if it was only part of your life, it was still in your records and those medical records still exist for a lot of individuals and families. Oh, I was thinking also about what's in the records of um, Davenport, who you mentioned at the beginning, the eugenics record office, it was actually a record keeping place. And those, literally those file cabinets with the little cards, those little member of libraries. Mm -hmm. What a library oh, used to look like. <laughs> 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 yeah, that, those um, biologists and um, sociologists who were working at the ERO collected thousands and thousands and thousands of individual little heredity cards where they track the traits of individuals in certain families. But I don't know, I guess they wouldn't publish those names, right? They would publish like pedigrees in the books, but not necessarily names, but those records still exist in Minnesota, right? Those card catalogs are still there. I wonder if we had them in Washington. Yeah. And yeah. if we did, yeah. think of the research project for that archival group of English students. Whole, many English classes are doing this archival yeah. project. Yeah, many archives. Yeah, also this wasn't that long ago. You know, that's the amazing yeah. thing to me. Yeah. Great grandparents were yeah, around, you know, it's pretty yeah. recent stuff. Um, which means that the paper hasn't deteriorated yet, and we can still look at them. Right, right. If you can find it. If yeah. you can find <laughs> it. Um, yes. Another thing that was done was a lot of like medical experimentation of like time. Yeah.
for example, the bottom is the same as the Yeah. All right. Well, we um, so, yes, um, it was an organized social movement primarily happening between 1900 and 1940s, um, but then many other countries had their own versions, many of which were modeled after what was going on here in the United States, um, including what happened uh, in Nazi Germany during the Holocaust. And one geneticist even said, the Germans are beating us at our own game, um, which, I don't know, I learned about the Holocaust in school, but I did not learn about the American eugenics movement and how, what was happening here in this country influenced what happened there and in other countries. Um, which is incredible that they just kind of skipped that part of history. <laughs> Did anyone else learn about the United Movement in school? Not until later. No. Yeah. No. No. Just don't really learn about it. But then I didn't learn about Japanese internment until I was <laughs> in graduate school. So. Right. Well, I'm not saying this is unique. It's not the only instance of this. But I think there's a lot they left out. Yeah. Historical patterns and what gets erased in the Bible. Um, Yes, so um, there was a Supreme Court decision called Buck versus Bell um, that happened in 1927. Um, and yeah, it involves the story of um, a girl who was adopted after she was born um, and became pregnant when she was 17 because she was raped and then she was admitted to an institution um, called the Virginia Colony for Epileptics and Feeble-Minded. Um, and she was admitted for feeble-mindedness, uh, incorrigible behavior, and promiscuity. <coughs> um, but, yes, so then she had a baby, um, and yeah, they just were saying that, well, you see the pedigree chart with the F standing for feeble-minded. <coughs> also, I like that the dotted lines represent um, illegitimate matings or something like that. These were not authorized. Um, so they said that three gener generations of imbeciles is enough, and they upheld the compulsory sterilization law in Virginia. Um, which, yes, just, um, yeah, saying that all this is okay. Um, so, yes, American eugenics targeted the defective, unfit, weaklings, paupers, criminals, the feeble-minded, chronic masturbators, degenerates, the morally deficient, the insane, prostitutes, epileptics, murderers, etc. Um, so, yes, what I kind of see happening is this creation of twin myths of, yeah, the feeble-minded menace, um, and also, yeah, this idea that the white race is dying out because of immigration. Um, and also, yes, within the white race, because of, yeah, people in rural areas or um, people who are not middle or upper middle class. Um, and yeah, there are fears of these lower classes reproducing at higher rates than the people who are holding, holding these positions of privilege and power. Um, and so, yes, um, we see scientific racism and classism, ableism, and sexism working to promote the desires of these people at the top. Um, I'm moving forward. Yeah. Okay. You? Well, what is the thought about? There must have been like old white men, like developed disabilities. So, but they wouldn't be, they would have had a whole life of not being feeble-minded. So, when they get categorized, like let's say your uncle developed Alzheimer's or something, would that at all change family dynamics? I don't really know. Who was it? Someone had one of 
some of the eugenicists had yeah, like some sort of genetic condition that resulted in mm -hmm. yeah, or like family members. I assume like if you have money, yeah, you're probably fine. You know, like um, what was uh, Henry Goddard? Later, he developed epilepsy, I think. Right. And he was a little bit stigmatized within the eugenics community because he had a disability at that point. Um, mm -hmm. Which, it, right, is an interesting question yeah. because, yeah, with disability being a category that comes and goes or arrives later in life, it's not like other. Say, were there any cases uh, within the eugenics movement where they uh, like uh, took away uh, took away the unfit points? You 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 got your whole rights back. For, you, oh, you, like you used to be considered unfit, and now now we changed our mind or something. Like if you become rich. Well. <laughs> <laughs> right. If you, well, I imagine it would be difficult to become rich if you were admitted to an institution. Um, but say right, you're in a rural family. Virginia, and then somehow some rich man from the city comes and takes you away. Um, yes, but I don't know about officially how that would yeah. work. Um, yeah. But certainly, I think you're drawing on a point of like if your class changed, then your perceived um, worth might also change. Right. Yeah. But I don't know. Can I suggest an example of response to that? There's a really short, wonderful essay in a book, unfortunately titled Mental Retardation in America. It's a recent history collection, unfortunate title. And the short article is about um, just, or at World War II, so kind of the tail end of the official eugenics movement, um, a bunch of individuals who had previously been incarcerated in institutions for folks labeled having intellectual disability, were out of the institutions and admitted into the army, and medically they were no longer given the diagnosis of low IQ. The standards of quote unquote normal IQ were officially changed at that historic moment because it was socially convenient to have more people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a really short piece, like six pages, but really makes nicely a point about the social constructiveness of the category. Um, right. It links it to eugenics and, and being segregated and everything, yeah. Right. Well, because a lot of, yeah, those labels came from these IQ tests that were really cultural, yeah. um, that they would give to immigrants from other countries yeah. when they would come here and they'd be like, oh, you don't know about bowling? Or, you know, I don't know, <laughs> other cultural American things. And so, yeah, you must not be intelligent because you don't understand cultural to the U.S. from Italy, and they, they put her in um, special education because she didn't speak the English. Right. Yeah. Right, and that sort of thing is still happening, and not just with people who don't speak English, but yeah. Yeah, maybe mm -hmm. see some 
I have paper, so if you want to write on paper and brainstorm, you can do that. I have some pens where you can stick in your head. Um, so let's scatter some paper. Can you brainstorm with the partner? Yes. Um, I will not mandate any groupings, <laughs> but if you'd like a mandated group, I'll assign you one. <laughs> Um, yeah, so what today reminds you of these eugenic practices? That's not a favorite. Do you like a piece of paper? Do you like pen? Yeah. Okay, yeah, great. Do you like a piece of paper? Yeah. Great. Right. Thanks. You have a pen? Do you like a piece of paper? Do you like a piece of paper? Yes? Oh, no, it's paper. Okay.
I was thinking of cochlear implants, but they're in, doing cochlear implants on deaf babies uh, to quote unquote make them hearing. on the family, or I, you may have heard the radio ads for behavioral therapist James Lehman, uh, who has verbiage who will shut your child right up and then behaving on the spot. Uh, yeah. That makes me think of over use of medication for ADD. Or oh, it's like I went to my 
my doctor about some, uh, I don't even know what they say. Uh, okay, I wanted a procedure that it would help me um, manage my period. And if I got the procedure done, it, it could mean that I would not be able to have kids. And my doctor was like, and usually they won't do it. Women who are under 40, and they were like, oh, you have a genetic disease. That makes sense. some of the ways uh, yeah. compared to there aren't necessarily the laws don't say right. anti-immigration, you know, right. it's uh -huh. not like that. But now it's things like the actuary tables that insurance companies use. They mm -hmm. don't say in their policies, we will not give you the same birth control as we would somebody else. But basically, so I think there's some more subtle ways that we're incorporating some of this. Definitely. That, that it's harder to get at and to change patterns because if people aren't talking about it here, now some of it that, you know, when people are saying, no, we don't want gays to be able to be married, that's at least more overt. Mm -hmm. But there's stuff happening, like I said, with the insurance actuary tables. And the only reason I use that is we're talking about prenatal testing. Now we're not only going to know the genomes, we're going to know the protein levels of each of our makeup. Mm -hmm. And I think you go to work and there's going to be, you know, people are, I don't want to hire you because I already know X, Y, and Z about your genetic makeup. And it's not going to be in the HR policy. So anyway, that, that was just a thought that what you were talking about made me think about is, yes, this is important too when we hear it to talk, of, you know, to right. shed some light on it. But some of it to me is more behind the scene when it's not accurate. Right, so I feel like it's reading into the subtleties and it's mm -hmm. trying to expose them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What they do to hide that subtlety is they make it about or like what's good for us. They think, say that well, that's good for us, that's, that's we're just doing what's good for you, you, you know, like, um, yeah, it's in your best interest, yeah, that sort of stuff, challenging that, saying, no, this isn't in our best interest, uh, like, 
when they're pushing for cures and for prenatal testing, just telling them, like, no, this isn't in our best interest. This isn't what we want. Right. And we'll just start because who is that, them? You know, like, who are we supposed to be talking to? Them? Yeah, well, <laughs> communities like uh, um, autistic people have really pushed back against um, the push for a cure, um, right. the push for prenatal testing. Um, for any other community children, disabled community who are, are also having the same sort of logic and understanding. I was just going to say that that concept, it just, when you had up earlier positive, what is it? The positive positive, and negative. positive and negative? That's the positive, is them spinning it to make it like it's a positive, but it's not really a positive. Right. So really, it's all. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Kind of sift through and think about. Yeah. Any final comments? I think that so. when people get together and have conversations like these, we're collectively pushing back, and the more people we can include in these conversations and educate, mm -hmm. um, you know, the better. And the, the, the louder our voices will be and I for a few months was working with a small organization in Portland called Northwest Downtown Association and they do lots of different things but one example of some of their, their social activism is they're trying to get together groups of people who can be a more neutral and or positive um, uh, person to counsel to counsel women who are pregnant who maybe learn that their babies do have Down syndrome. And so um, kind of pushing back at who's in the room, talking to the families to provide more perspectives and opportunities for support. And I thought that that, I mean, that's just one very clear example of people on the ground um, kind of trying to infiltrate a larger system. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, in preparing this conversation, I was just thinking, like, oh, like, what authority do I have to talk about? these things, because I'm not an expert, I don't have a degree, you know, but um, I feel like a lot of it is, right, how can we disassemble these hierarchies of knowledge and power and just educate ourselves and you know, try to learn as much as we can and don't let them silence you.